All right. Um, hello, everybody. I am uh, going to try to answer some of your questions that have been raised um, on derivative trading. Um, so this is the first one um, that I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> now, the uh, there are two questions here. The first one uh, actually uh, is concerning questions 14 and 15 in problem set 1. In the interest of time, I'm going to be quite brief. Um, and where questions are already covered um, in tutorials, uh, w which are also recorded, uh, I'm not going to go through them again. And this is an example. Um, I will, however, go through this one here. Um, so the question is um, on lecture number 8, pages 5 and 6. Don't know how to use or use what method to find the risk free arbitrage and how to calculate the profit. To be more specific, at what time do we just go long a call and sell a stock and don't put, don't consider any put? And at what other time would, are, you, are you gonna um, long a put, sell a call and buy a stock? Um, in this instance, I think it's actually um, the other way around. So you 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 don't long a put you you uh, you long the call and then you short sell some stocks, um, which is the same as um, having a long put position. And uh, if you are going to offset that, you're going to sell the put. Okay, now let's let's just actually take a look. Um, at lecture eight, um, pages five and six. Okay, I think they look like this. Um, <clears throat> so let me uh, take a look. Uh, lecture eight, pages five and six. So the student is um, actually referring to an opportunity where um, <clears throat> the Hang Seng futures are currently trading at 22,040 and there is a call out there in the market um, priced at 1010 uh, strike 21,000. Now, I think I, I understand your question and um, the, um, the thing to think about is I think it's helpful to think about arbitrage uh, in another way. Um, arbitrage is a word that is much used and misused and sometimes abused um, by finance practitioners and some people you know, call something arbitrage um, when in reality it's nothing like it. Um, so don't make that mistake. Do, do not liberally call something arbitrage the moment you, you feel there's a profit to be made. Um, if you if you borrow some money uh, at the risk-free rate and you uh, use that borrowed money to, to buy some you know high yield corporate bonds and you think you, you borrow at a cheap rate and you receive a high yield that is not an arbitrage, okay? Because you you are running some risks. I think the um, uh, the formal so be be careful because um, a lot of people in in finance practice you know do do make that mistake and they just call bloody every other thing an arbitrage um, and don't 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 make that mistake yourself, okay? Um, now an arbitrage essentially is. Um, uh, a kind of financial transaction uh, or it could be a package where uh, there is at least some chance of making a profit and there is no chance of making a loss okay how about that so in other words it's there's a there's a more than uh, zero chance. There's a positive chance of making a um, a non-negative uh, PNL. So non-negative means sometimes zero, uh, but sometimes positive. Now, in the case here, um, 
So I think if you if you have that in mind, it's better you have that in mind rather than try to remember these rules about oh whether should I should I buy the call and short the future and long the put and so on. That, that because it depends on the circumstance and you will see in a moment why. Okay, um, so the um, the way I like to think about arbitrage is you know any kind of um, financial structure where you have um, some chance of making a profit and, and and no chance of making a loss and it should also be self-financing okay which means you don't need to have any of your own money uh, in order for, for, for it to work um, so here um, if you were to buy a call uh, and you pay this amount okay uh, then of course you have to you have to bo borrow money from the, you can borrow money from from a bank in order to buy the uh, the call and then you short sell the futures um, at twenty two thousand and forty. Now you take one look at this and um, it would you ask yourself okay do I uh, do I um, you know never make a loss and sometimes make a profit okay that is the question um, now in this instance um, uh, what, what has happened is that uh, you buy a call at 21,000 and uh, you pay 1,010 uh, 1, points um, but if you were able to sell the futures at twenty two thousand and forty, then you can think of three scenarios commonly that's how I think about it. Scenario one is uh what if futures really goes through the roof okay Scenario two is what if it does absolutely nothing and just stays where it is and scenario three is what if it crashes all the way to zero um if you can satisfy yourself that there's profit to be made in these three, uh, you know, one neutral and two extreme scenarios, if that was the case, then uh, there already is an arbitrage. Now, let's say the futures rises to um, 32,040. Okay, what happens then? Well, um, you are going to make a loss uh, because you you short sold the futures, and your your loss will be um, precisely minus uh, ten thousand points. Okay, and then um, you also um, you paid you paid initially this amount. Okay, so that would be um, the total loss uh, eleven thousand and ten. Okay. Now, what is your gain? Your gain uh, will be the intrinsic value, which is this one, minus the uh, the call strike, um, which is actually uh, eleven thousand and forty. Okay, so you you will always lock in that thirty points, no matter what. Uh, it doesn't matter; it really goes through the. Uh, goes through the roof um, in fact this 30 points um, you also get to keep here if markets do absolutely nothing now what if it drops to zero I know that's very extreme okay but you know that's that's the way I like to think you think of really extreme scenarios if it drops to zero um, then of course uh, you will make uh, Twenty-two thousand and forty on your um, on your short, and then the um, the option would expire, worthless. Okay, and uh, in fact, you end up making even more money uh, in in this case. Okay, so it's it's like twenty-one thousand uh, and thirty points. Okay, now this is precisely uh, the the classic payoff of a put option where there is some money but in fact ordinarily for a put option um, this is a short put but if you're long if you're long put um, 
then you should be paying something. Okay, the key here is that um, because the premium on a call is even less than the current intrinsic value between the spot market 22,040 22, and the strike, okay, so you are guaranteed that uh, in fact here you are guaranteed that you always make some money and you never make a loss um, and um, so that already would, would be a sufficient condition for an arbitrage now what if now now think of it this way if you were to then buy this call and you short sell some stocks but at the same time so this is this is a, like an artificial or synthetic um, being long the put. Okay, if you at the same time go short a put, okay, is this still an arbitrage? That's the question I think. Okay, now so instead of remembering this rule and that rule, should I buy or should I sell? Should I make a combination? Think of it this way. Okay, am I still making profit either uh, all of the time? and making losses not at all okay because that that would be um, the condition for an arbitrage uh, is, is that still happening okay and of course the answer is is yes um, when you when you uh, buy the call at 21,000 and you short sell at 22,040 and you sell a call sell sorry sell a put and you sell a put, then you're going to um, hit someone's bid at ten. Okay, now you, so you're going to add. What 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 happens when you do that? What you have done is um, you have locked in uh, a total of not thirty now, but forty points of profit. Now, so you ask yourself again. Okay, is this strategy going to uh, always make me some profit and uh, never make a loss uh, you know at least um, at least to give me zero okay now if it goes up the roof um, the put that you sold is not relevant so you, you still get to keep this 30 plus the 10 that originally um, you when you sold that extra put okay uh, if the market does nothing okay you still get to keep that 30 plus the 10 okay now if the if the market really crashes all the way down then what happens is um, as soon as it goes beyond uh, 21,000 and it keeps heading down okay so the put will come into play so I guess 21,000 um, is a kind of turning point. So ask yourself what happens at that point. Okay. Now what, what happens at that point is that uh, the call will not be, uh, well at precisely that point, okay, the, the, uh, the call will not be exercised um, and the short future uh, will have a profit of uh, 1040 okay and um, hold on and the um, uh, of course you 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 bought a call so this is what you paid okay um, and then you also got paid an extra 10 for the put so when you add it all up uh, it is still uh, 40 points now what if it keeps going down okay uh, if it keeps going down, then basically um, any extra profit that you make on your short, okay, so the, the, you, you keep making more profit on your short selling, uh, will be offset by uh, someone exercising the put against you, okay. So no matter what happens, you have still locked in 40, okay. So in either case, um, you have you have some some kind of arbitrage in there okay um, so I th that's the way I like to look at it okay now of course there's one very important uh, component 
that we have not really mentioned in this very simplified example, and that is um, your interest costs uh, does affect you. Um, so depending on at what rate you can borrow money to buy your call options, um, it would it would have some influence. But that aside, okay, don't don't worry about that. Um, instead of thinking about arbitrage, is okay. I'm always going to long a call short of future, and then and then short sell a put. No, you don't have to think about it like that. Um, as long as there's a bargain to be made, where sometimes you make a profit and never you make a loss, um, that is already sufficient condition for an arbitrage. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now let me um, let me try and tackle the the next one, um, which is um, this question here, uh, lecture one. Um, so this is question number two uh, on the second page. Uh, of of that document, can you please interpret the flash order, uh, routing orders, and intermarket sweeping orders again? Uh, I I don't think this is um. It's actually you know you you have to be a pretty specialized kind of trader to uh, really make use of these. Um, now the 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 flashing order is um. Uh, it, it works like this. Um, so when you are at least in the in the United States and maybe some other exchanges, um, so sometimes there can be um, you know a, a customer, and um, they may have a a big order. Let's say they have a big parcel of Alibaba they want to sell, um, and um, so they will talk to their broker. A stock broker. Now, of course, the stock broker can can just uh, there 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 are different things that they can do. Um, so, for example, they can just uh, send it you know, directly um, to uh, the stock exchanges. Um, and um, another way you can do it is that the the broker, the stock broker. Um, actually sends your order to just one one particular exchange um, so in in the US for example there's a New York Stock Exchange there's NASDAQ um, and then there are other re regional exchanges you know even in, in let's say Philadelphia or Kansas City or whatever okay so maybe they just send it to one particular exchange um, and they only uh, send that uh, to that exchange and that exchange uh, will and, and and they will send it as a as a flash order okay so this is a particular exchange and they will send that as a flash order now what that means is there are there will be other market makers behind um, who have paid a fee um, in order to be able to to look at um, this kind of flash order information, so not everyone sees it, and the other exchanges will not be aware of it. Exchange Y, Z, or whatever. Okay. Um, now you might ask, why why do these guys want to pay a fee um, to to the exchange uh, in order to see this information? Well, you know if. If a client um, has a big order to buy or sell, um, and you you are able to um, see that in advance, uh, of course, it's very very um, you know it's privileged information. Okay, and you might wonder, well, from the customer's point of view, you know why why would they want to do that? Um, and the the the, the answer is. Um, if you have a big parcel of something you want to get rid of, um, it's it's a it's a balance. It's a question between letting the whole world know know, know about it or just letting a select few people. Because if the whole world knows, okay, then people are are, are going to try to 
get in front of you um, and buy before you buy or sell before you sell and so on so with with a flash order um, the idea is you only show it to uh, one exchange and that exchange will only show it to a select few people um, and if they were acting in good faith these people may actually you know by, by seeing the or by showing them your flash order um, they may come round and actually um, uh, you know take on the trade on the on the other side if you're buying then they might sell they might sell or if you want to sell they might buy from you um, and then the execution is far more um, uh, it's it's orderly and um, you, you you get more privacy okay that's the theory anyway okay um, now routing order um, routing order is just um, when you when you are when you want to buy or sell something and you tell you, you speak to your stockbroker um, they actually have quite a lot of freedom um, who they go to um, uh, and they, they normally there's a program okay there's some kind of algorithm that they will execute to get you the best price um, sometimes um, you know a customer can can make you know specific requirements or adjustments such that um, your order only goes to um, you know certain market makers you, you can say okay please just um, uh, show this to um, you know JP Morgan or Credit Suisse okay it's not the same as the flash order okay which which actually is often a big order that goes to uh, one particular exchange uh, and then that exchange will show it to um, a select group of um, market makers who have paid a fee to see exactly that kind of information okay um, intermarket sweep orders um, are um, okay the the, um, the the stock market um, you know in, in, in the US for example works like this so if you wanted to buy let's say um, 100 shares of Microsoft um, and you and then and then there there are two exchanges and let's say in in exchange uh, in exchange X uh, so in exchange X uh, there there are um, 20 shares available um, at a price of ten dollars and then in in exchange Y uh, there are um, 80 shares available at a price of um, ten dollars and um, uh, let's say ten dollars and ten cents okay now ordinarily if you want to buy a hundred shares um, and you send an order out um, you will only get this order executed and um, you you will then have to uh, enter a new order in order to buy the other 80 shares it's actually a kind of protective mechanism um, for the investor get that you always you always get the best price um, even if it's for a, a smaller parcel okay now if you specify that, that you want to do a, a need to market sweep order then the um, the the order will be sent simultaneously um, to different exchanges and basically you will get filled at different prices um, until your, all your requirements are met okay so that's the difference um, <clears throat> for uh, in, so, so the second question here in page 57 is the 500 bid price at 251 will be executed at 250 and the rest 100 bid price at 250 will be executed at 250 um, yes I kind of already made um, some coverage on this 
uh, in another video called um, auction mechanics um, but if you need to have a look at this so on in lecture one page 57 um, so lecture one um, page 57 is regarding uh, the the dynamics between um, uh, people who are who are looking to buy and sell stocks um, here so you I, I advise you to go to that video where I explain in a lot of detail about how this works but in essence yes so these guys here um, who are happy to buy at 251 they have the priority um, to buy although in the end they might get lucky um, so the, these 500 bids okay uh, they might get lucky and they may actually execute at a better price than 251 um, likewise on the other side um, these guys have priority um, to sell at 250 although if they're lucky um, they might be able to sell at 251 okay so here you have um, uh, a, a buy level matching a buy level here and a sell level so a buy level here matching a sell level here and a buy level here matching a sell level here so either 250 or 251 are possible um, the question is you you would choose the 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 price which will allow you to match um, the bigger quantity okay which in this case is 600 okay um, that is the uh, that is the idea okay so um, at a price of two two hundred and fifty okay um, all of these people uh, would be able to sell and on this other side um, if you are happy to buy at 251 uh, then of course you are also happy to buy at 250 so all these will buy at 250 and of these 600 people here 100 of them will also buy at 250 so there's a queue and there are different conventions uh, on how you queue up um, in different different um, different countries okay um, if the price if the clearing price was set at 251 let's say okay um, then only 500 trades uh, or 500 shares will get cleared um, because that's the lesser of the two numbers here between 500 here and uh, 600 here okay so you always choose a larger number okay okay um, I am now going to have a look at um, question question three I think I can find it. Uh, okay, here we are. Um, now, question. Uh, this is the, these are the questions on page three. Um, I've already gone through these questions um, during the tutorials. I don't intend to repeat myself here. Um, for question 13, uh, with share trading at 100, I'm long for gammas. Uh, which of the following delta hedge re regimes would you prefer? I thought we should choose the one with the more movement. Um, no, you should not. Um, that's, that's exactly the point about this question. You do not choose the one with the, with the most movement. Um, it's all about earning that gamma revenue, which is a half times gamma times ds square okay and whichever whichever um, price pattern gives you a bigger profit is the one that you should go for okay and not whether it keeps going up and down up and down um, so um, you and you can work that out just by by simply plugging in the um, the, the numbers um, and you'd realize that the, the first one is by far the best you know, when it's just simply you want one big whopping movement instead of a lot of little ones okay um, now the 
on the fourth page. Um, so again, uh, this is something I have already covered in tutorial. So please kindly um, refer to that. Um, uh, page number five. Um, can you please explain jumping the queue again? Sorry, I couldn't understand it. Now this is related to uh, lecture one, page eighty to eighty two. Um, so let's take a look at that. Um, so is this lecture one? No, this is lecture eight. Uh, I need to open up lecture one. Bear with me. Uh, um yeah um so lecture one um and um so what page was it Okay, uh, so the student was referring to this page about jumping the queue. Now, the uh, the idea here is this. Uh, so first, you have something uh, fundamentally quite similar trading in two different markets: the Eurex market and the Singapore exchange. Um, the first thing to recognize is that um, the spread. The bid offer in the Eurex is a lot tighter than the spread you find in the SGX market, and I've already explained. Normally, there is a reason because this is the main market, and this is kind of like the side market. Um, it's a lot smaller. Um, it's quiet. Um, the side, the transaction sizes are, um, you know, typically also. Smaller. In, in other words, it's not so liquid. Okay, it's not so active. Um, whenever you have a situation like that, when the same thing or something similar is trading in two different places, two different time zones, and one has a bid offer like this, and the other has a bid offer which is wider, then there are opportunities. Okay. Um, there are opportunities because if you are a price maker, maker, and for some reason you are able to buy here, okay. So this is the price maker's bid and price maker's offer on the uh, less liquid market, and this is the um, price maker's bid. An offer on a more liquid market. Okay, so what you can do is you actually can buy here. Okay, and you can either uh, sell here. That would be the best. Okay, so you 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 make a bid, the price you want. You you are happy to buy, and um, you put out another price where you hope you're happy to sell. The problem is, of course, you 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 got to wait till someone comes along. Okay, that's the that's the bad thing about. Being a price maker, the good thing is you make more money. You earn th this entire gap. Okay. Now the other thing is, of course, you can buy. You can buy here. You can buy here, and um, you can sell here. Okay, at the offer side of the more active market. Now, because it's a more active market, you have a better chance of um, executing. Than you know, compared to the less active market, and we really are quite often just talking about matter of seconds, if not even less. Okay, uh, whereas in the less active markets, you could be talking that matter of minutes. Okay? It's all relative. Okay. Now the third thing you can do is um, you can buy here, okay, uh, or you can you can sell as a price taker, okay, in the uh, on the bid side in the uh, in the more active market now that you can do right away because if you sell at the bid 
you are you are taking somebody else's price that will always be readily available. You don't have to wait. Okay, you just go in there and you just um, you hit someone's bid, as it were. Okay, is the uh, is the jargon. Now here you can see that um, you have uh, a situation where uh, the in, in the Eurex market it was 2,800 bid, 2,801 offer, and in the um, Singapore exchange 2,799 bid, 802 offer. Okay, so what you do is um, if you just join the bid at let's say 2799 if you enter another bid so all that happens is this number here will go up from 100 to let's say 200 okay and, and then you just join the queue now if you want to get in front what you do is you type okay as a price maker maker okay that you are happy to buy so you bid 100 uh, shares at 100 contracts at 2,800 so you're happy to buy at one one point higher immediately your um, your entry will appear like this okay so in other words the um, the bid offer has now tightened okay so previously it was three points and now it's already two points and it's two points thanks to you because you enter this one that's what jumping to queue means okay so you are you are now in front and you have priority now notice that um, if someone uh, was happy to sell to you at this price 2800 in Singapore okay three things can happen so either you uh, enter a, a, an offer at 2802 and then you can make two points but then you have to wait you just put the price you you put the offer price there and you wait until someone comes along and say ah oh, okay uh, i'll buy at 2802 uh, or you buy at 2800 and you sell you go to the other market and you sell at 2801 now here again um you put this is your offer and you have to wait until someone comes along and is happy to to um uh what what they call lift your offer okay um, but then because this is the urex is a much more active market uh you could well be waiting sometimes just a few seconds maybe even less okay now if that doesn't work so if there's no there's no one uh, wants to buy at this price in singapore and no one wants to buy at this price in europe um, you can still just get out in time uh, and sell at the same price okay again you do so as a price taker okay so you sell at this um, and and that you can do right away okay because you are not uh, you're not trading as a price maker anymore so the idea is if sometimes you can make uh, oops, what happened there if sometimes you can make uh, a lot more money if sometimes you can make money here if sometimes you can make money here and so, sometimes you don't you make no money by buying at 2800 and selling at 2800 so you have all these scenarios okay and then let's just say they all happen with equal probability and you can run you, you, can, you can use data to run and, and, and see whether it works um then just doing something so simple okay will have a positive expectation it's like going to the, it's like going to the casino okay if i tell you there is a roulette somewhere um where there's a there's a, it's broken and and there's a third of a chance you might make two dollars there's one third of a, of a chance you make one dollar there's a third of a chance you make nothing um apart from the transaction costs okay if i tell you if i was to tell you there is such a roulette table somewhere in macau 
you would go there with the speed of light and just really clean up, wouldn't you? Okay, so this is this is kind of a, a similar idea. Okay. Okay, I am now going to have a look at the uh, question on page six. So this is a question set six. Um, so this is uh, related to lecture one. Uh, page 105 to 106. Since we have calculated our theoretical bid uh, 2,308 and offer 2,313, why in page 106 do we use the market ask price um, 2,310 as our buy level? Why not this one? Is it because we don't want to wait? Um, Okay, this is what is called um, inventory-based uh, pricing. Actually, I think let's just go to uh, lecture one, page one hundred five. Okay, so lecture one, um, page one hundred five. Um, page one hundred five. Um, I think for this this one, um, you you kind of have to start off uh, from around page one hundred. Um, and again, this is the contrast of uh, trading two markets where one is more active and more liquid than the other. Uh, in this case, it's the DAX um, versus um, Euro stocks futures. You can tell immediately that the the bid offer of the DAX is a lot tighter. So this is our active market. Okay, um, this is kind of like the the support market. Now this time is a little bit different from the uh, example between trading the Eurex and the Singapore Exchange, where there you are trading something which uh, has far closer resemblance than here. Uh, these are just very correlated indices, but they are different. Uh, they are different instruments. So the theory is, the theory is that they will always be um, locked together uh, in a certain kind of ratio. Now, of course, if that theory is not, is not valid, then everything falls apart. So let's just say that it is, at least in the long run, actually valid um, then what you do is um, you want to uh, in the support market you want to be a price maker price maker and then in the active market you want to be a price taker uh, which will allow you to um, turn around um, and actually hedge yourself um, Pretty easily and uh, very with with you know very fast and very efficient. So here um, you are happy to buy at two thousand three hundred and ten um, in the uh, euro stocks. So um, here the idea is that you know if that if that um, relationship uh, or ratio really uh, exists between these two markets then the moment they are a little bit um, diverging from that relationship you can try to take advantage of it um, by making prices in the less active market um, and then hedging yourself in the more active market however um, you want to do this with a bit of caution um, so you would adjust your uh, market making bids and offers according to how much of a position you have already accu already accumulated uh, so if you were if you were going to um, uh, trade on the uh, long side uh, for for the uh, euro stocks then you will be buying at 2010 okay and then you'll be selling and you you sell at someone's bid um, at 6800 that's where these came from okay that's why several pages later uh, you actually see 
some further development. So you 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 buy at this level, okay, and uh, you buy on the uh, the euro stocks, and then you 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 go short to the DAX uh, at six thousand eight hundred. Okay, now then uh, if you're going to keep accumulating your positions, uh, you will adjust according to a certain formula um, and you become more and more conservative okay so here so for the for the euro stocks um, after you have accumulated this position so you are you are short one contract in DAX and you are long one a uh, long seven in the euro stocks now these are the actual market prices but for you okay if you are going to keep acting as a market maker uh, in the euro stocks uh, you your spreads will be wider because you are now more conservative you are more more you are more conservative because you already have some positions okay so you don't want to buy so you want to buy cheaper and you want to sell more expensive so your spreads are widening uh, and they are based on the formula here okay um, and then if you were to um, actually unwind okay so the question asked to me was how come um, uh, you are buying at 2310 well this was a position to begin with okay on the um, around five pages ago when I was showing you so you can have a look at that um, and if you want to get if you want to get out of here okay then what you do is you unwind your um, euro stocks position okay um, hopefully uh, by the selling at your at your offer okay and then simultaneously you turn around and and then and then also buy back uh, your shorts uh, in DAX uh, but that would be uh, you buy back at someone's offer okay you are a price taker here okay um, so in the less active market you act as a price maker um, which is always a good thing because you earn more money um, because of wider spreads uh, but you gotta wait okay and then in the active liquid market you use that for for hedging out because it's very fast um, and you can the prices are always available if you if you buy at the offer and you sell at the bid okay that's the idea so that's question six thank you